Good morning. Let's take our hymn books and turn to number 511. Where could I go to the Lord? One of J.B. Coates' better songs. We'll do the first to last verse. Number 511.
Good morning. I want to apologize. I've been battling a head cold since last Saturday. For some reason, I keep losing ground in the battle. But uh, I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to Sunday school here at North Carthage Baptist Church. Brother Gentry, your announcement. The uh, first announcement this morning, Bible study Wednesday night at 6.30. Brother Sheely will be teaching from the book of Revelation, the Lord willing. Birthdays this morning, Brother Jack Petrus and Miss Lee Ann Dosty. Happy birthday uh, to both of these. I don't have any anniversaries, any other birthdays or anniversaries that I don't have down. All right, I don't have any deaths. Prayer requests, Miss Lois Hamlet, uh, Miss uh, Christine McDonald, Miss Atheline Shoulders, uh, Miss Juanita Taylor, Bill and Olene Harwell, uh, Brother Kenny's mother, Kenny Ingram, uh, Miss Anita Searcy. Miss Anita is sick, not able to be here this morning. And uh, if the adult women don't have a teacher, you all may come out here uh, for the uh, Sunday school this morning. Brother Mark Andrews and Mr. Wally Wood, are there any other requests? Brandon, Kyle, and Susie Keenan. Any others? <coughs> Okay. All right, any others? Let's remember all of these uh, requests, Brother Jason. This time we'd like to go to the Lord and word of prayer. Brother Sheely, you mind leading us? Father, we are grateful today for your watch care and your providing our needs each day for keeping us safe. And Father, when we have accidents or troubles, you bring us through those, and we're so grateful. There are many today that are sick and they're hurting. We pray especially for Sister Anita. She's been having to deal with this problem medically for a long time. And we pray, Lord, that you'd bless her and restore her health if it please you. For others on our prayer list, we pray that you'd bring healing to their bodies. Father, we pray for our nation today. We're in a, a lot of trouble as a nation of people. We need your help. We need your leadership. We pray that your will would be accomplished politically and spiritually especially. We pray for our service today, for each teacher, for each classroom, that you'd bless the teachers as they try to present the word of God. And Brother Gentry, as he preaches to us today, may we worship you in spirit and in truth and praise you for the great things you've done. We're looking forward to the day when we'll see the Lord and be able to spend eternity with you. We'll thank you and praise you now in Christ's name. We ask it. Amen. 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 <coughs> I just want to start off by saying the Lord's been good to me over the last 34 years of my life. And uh, I want to thank Him for all the many blessings that He's given me in my lifetime. The greatest blessing of all that He's ever given, He's ever bestowed upon me is the same salvation of my soul when I was 13 years old. <clears throat> when He accepted me as a, one of His children. And we have churches today that are teaching uh, <clears throat> that if you, you can get up and stand up and uh, uh, say that you love the Lord and that, and that we accept the Lord in our hearts that that, uh, that you're saved or teaching that this baptism we're back here can save your soul well I'm sorry people that, uh, we're, we're not big enough to accept, accept God uh, God has to accept you uh, it says it here in 
uh, in John chapter 2, verses, uh, <clears throat> verses 3 through 7. Sorry, I didn't see that turn the page there. When Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, he plainly states it, that you have to be born again. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born, born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. This concludes our reading lesson. For all, please stand. We'll have a word verse for song and pass our classes. <coughs> Let's all stand and we'll sing the first verse. <laughs> This morning our lesson is, what's the sign? It's uh, the week of February 21st. We're in uh, Matthew again, chapter 12, verses 38 through 42. And the, the title of our lesson is, what's the sign? The proof of his rule is found in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, these five verses before we start. Men certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master. We would see a sign. We would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with his generation and shall condemn it, because they repented, repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. <clears throat> this morning, as you look and uh, as you look around, there's a lot of signs that point different directions and different things. Uh, you know, there's the signs that tell you how many miles there are. There's signs that tell you you which how many uh, which direction you're going east west. There's signs that tell you to stop. You know, there's red lights that tell you to go yield stop. One way, there's, there's all different signs that we look at to, to travel around this world. However, I'm going to ask you a question. It says, in our first thoughts, it says, we all from time to time look for a sign from heaven to direct our paths. And uh, last night I asked my wife, I said, I want you to give me some things that uh, if you were looking for a sign, some, some things that we've come across in our life that we might have looked for a sign. And she uh, said, Job, family, college, where to go to or what to major in, house, kids, marriage, and large purchases. Now, for each of you that may be different, but probably at times you have looked for these signs. What do I do? Where do I go? Do I go right or do I go left? Do I borrow the money to buy this house, do I buy this car or do I buy that car, which, which college do I go to, what am I going to major in, how do I help this kid, what, where, the, where am I going to send them to college at, all the things that, that we go through in our daily life. Um, and our uh, lesson this morning is about a sign. And uh, I'm going to go back and read where it says, what's the sign? And it says, the proof of his rule is found in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And the second word of that is proof. Now, I said last week, standing right up there, that I am a show-me guy. With football, I'm a show-me guy. Show me film, show me unpracticed, whatever, to convince me. And, and I am a show-me guy. However, me, nor you, did not live when Jesus lived. We didn't get to see the miracles. We didn't get to see the healing. We didn't, we didn't get to see any of that. We didn't see him walk on water. We didn't see him on the cross. We didn't see him raised from the dead. We didn't see any of those things. However, the very first question I was asked when I was ordained as a deacon is, do you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Then my answer was yes. And they didn't ask if I believed Genesis chapter 1 or Matthew chapter 12. They said the entire Bible. And uh, my answer was yes. And so as I'm teaching this lesson today, I want you to think back about this and about proof. And it says uh, in, the, in the passage of the first thoughts, this week's core passage tells us of a time when some scribes and Pharisees approached Jesus to ask for a sign from him. Their request had its origins in the hearts of unbelief that were disposed to reject Jesus' message and saving mission. By contrast, sin sincere Christians who put out fleeces or ask for confirming witnesses have their request originating in the hearts of faith that are disposed to do God's will. So this morning, there's going to be a dividing road, and it's very simple. It's, 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 it's the core of your relationship with Christ. There's two sides of it. There's an unbelief side, and there's a faith side. You either believe it, or you don't. There's no black and white. And this morning, we're going to get into that uh, with our lesson. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 50, um, it gives us on page 123 several things that was going on. 
It says, first there was controversy about the disciples picking and eating some heads of grain on the Sabbath day. The second, there was controversy over the Sabbath observance, and uh, Jesus' critics challenged him with a question about whether the healing on the Sabbath was a lawful activity. Next, the Pharisees accused Jesus of being in a league with the prince of demons, and Jesus accused his critics of blasphemy. Then, at, in verses 33 through 37, Jesus reminded the hearers that a tree's fruit matches the health of its root system. Good roots equal good fruit, but bad root, roots result in bad fruit. Jesus declared that people are accountable for what they do and say. They take away truth in, their, in that our deeds, whether good or bad, have their origin, origin in our hearts. And then last in verse 46 through 50, Jesus wanted uh, the, the hearers to take away the truth that the real kinship with Jesus is based on a genuine spiritual relationship. And uh, with that, that gives you a little background of what we're going to do today. But verse 38, it says, seeking a sign. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Often we tend to paint all the scribes and Pharisees with the same brush, profiling them alike. We stop and think. When we stop and think, we realize some of the individuals were praiseworthy such as Nicodemus, and um, the scribe that Jesus described as not being far from God's kingdom. However, many of the scribes and Pharisees did deserve Jesus' description of them as hypocrites from Matthew chapter 23. From among this latter group, some approached Jesus with a request for a sign. So he is, he is in here meeting with the scribes and Pharisees who in the last couple of verses... They talked about controversy and critics and, um, and them hearers. And so he is going to label them as hypocrites. He said the scribes were experts in the scribes were experts in the Mosaic law. As a group, they had their origin as copyists of the Old Testament scriptures, something that had to be done by hand. The occupation re this occupation resulted in their becoming very familiar with the books of the Old Testament. Over time, that familiarity led to them becoming the experts in interpreting and teaching the sacred scriptures. We might think of the scribes as professional teachers in Jesus' day. So, again, we've talked about the law, and they were teachers of the law. They were pinpoint to the, to the point of even adding, you have to do this and this and this and this and this to keep that law. And... Um, we talked about that they, they were critics of the disciples and of Jesus for, uh, for to doing, doing things on the Sabbath that, that, that uh, necessarily did not fit into their interpretation of the law. The Pharisees apparently had a noble beginning as laypersons who became deeply concerned over the neglect of the Mosaic law. Their concern fed the movement to become devoted practitioners of the law. Over time... This devotion caused them to come, become an extremely legalistic group that sought to set forth meticulously detailed lists of actions that violated the law. As a movement, their mission was to impose detailed law-keeping on people. In pursuit of that, the Pharisees became exclusive. They tended to look down on their ordinary countrymen as ignorant sinners from whom they needed to separate themselves. Outward appearances took precedent over inward reality. Therefore, Jesus often labeled the group as hypocrites. Now, we all know people who, of course, I'll first say we all will agree in here we're all sinners. But we all know people that sit back and think, well, I'm doing everything right, and I'm better than you because of what you're doing. Okay? So now, Jesus is basically calling a spade a spade for what they're doing. Uh, being the sinners that they are, they're not keeping at what they are and looking down on people. So the scribes and Pharisees introduced their demand for a sign with, the, with what sounded like a polite approach. Of course, we cannot tell if they were sincere or sarcastic in addressing Jesus as master, a favorite title given to Jesus by common people. Their term for a sign was one that meant a mighty work or a deed of unusual power. Now, uh, with the way things were working, when they came up and asked him, 
master, in my opinion. It was very uh, sarcastic and, and going, but that's what the people, the common people, as they call them, were calling him. And, and they wanted to see another sign, okay? He had already been teaching in Galilee, in the area around Galilee, and performed several, several, several miracles. And we've talked about those in, in the past couple of weeks. Now, they come to him and say they want a sign. And uh, in the teacher's edition, it talks about they didn't want to see another miracle. They wanted to basically see a sign from God or a sign from heaven that basically says you are who you say you are. And they wanted to let Jesus to basically answer them and, and prove to them one more time that he was who he says he was. It says, why would the scribes and Pharisees ask Jesus for a sign? Jesus already had performed many miracles. Why wouldn't they have taken them as signs of his authenticity? Part of the answer might lie in the fact that the scribes and Pharisees were already accusing Jesus of being in the league with the devil. And thus they took his power to do wonders as coming from unholy connection. Although they did not specify what kind of miracle would serve as a sign they desired, perhaps they wanted Jesus to perform on demand some deed of power that would occur in instantaneously such as they could verify did not involve invoking demonic powers or that could not be accounted for by some natural explanation. So they wanted more. They had seen those signs, the miracles and his teaching and preaching and his healing, but they wanted more. It says identifying the sign in verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign and there shall be no sign, no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Jesus' response to the request for a sign was to label his generation evil and adulterous. By implication, he included the scribes and Pharisees in that description. They were members of that generation. Old Testament prophets frequently used adultery to, to describe the people of their day. They, were, they used it as a metaphor or in a spiritual sense to describe people who were unfaithful to God. In particular, they applied the concept of adultery to those who forsook God to engage in the worship of idols. When idolatry had been effective and effectively eliminated among Jesus' time, he still used the term to describe a generation that largely failed to practice exclusive devotion to God and his commandments. Instead, they followed human traditions or devised ways to circumvent straightforward obedience to God's commandments, such as distortions amounted to wickedness in Jesus' eyes, he described his, his generation as evil. Uh, in the uh, teacher's guide, it asks the question. He described them as evil and adulterous. Evil and adulterous. And, and going back, he said, the, the writer says, look at our generation. Look at our generation. What would he describe us as? Um, but he goes back to the, using the Old Testament words, of the Old Testament prophecy, and the metaphor of adultery and unfaithful to God and the worship of idols and calling them evil and adulterous. It says, furthermore, unwillingness to receive God's word in simple faith as evidence in wanting to, to condition obedience on the performance of signs was also deserving of the label of evil. Unbelief is the soul out of which springs the needs for signs. This unbelief and testing of God is different than the believers seeking confirmation of God's direction. And again, they wanted a sign. They wanted proof. You know, I asked, I asked you before I started, have you ever looked for a sign or have you ever I'm going to put it this way. Have you ever prayed to God for the Holy Spirit for direction? There's a difference in believing and trusting in God and asking him to point you in the right direction than saying, God, give me a, or just show me a sign. I need a sign. I need some type of sign to go from left to right. Um, and these, uh, these scribes and Pharisees, that's what they wanted. They wanted some miraculous sign to point to him to saying this is the one, he is who he says he is, instead of the belief that his faith and miracles and his teaching and preaching wasn't, wasn't enough. On the uh, 
Bible skill there on page 126. It says topology is the method of interpreting of interpretation that understands that people or events of the Old Testament pointed to a future event, most often to Jesus Christ. And uh, to me, in studying, I like studying the New Testament more than I like studying the Old Testament. However, the history person of me likes studying the Old Testament when I am smart enough and, and have the stuff to understand. Uh, all of it, all of it, everything in this book fits together. There's nothing in Genesis, and, and I'll just open, Samuel, Chronicles, Job. It all fits together, and it is all there for a purpose, and it all in the Old Testament points to Jesus' coming in the New Testament. And it all, it all works together. And all of this, when Jesus is teaching and preaching and doing things, he often reverts back to the Old Testament and things that have happened. And it all ties together. Now, uh, Brother Sheely and Brother Gentry are a lot smarter than I am. And they can tie all this together and go, hopefully, someday, I'll be smart enough to tie some of it together. And, and we'll be able to uh, understand it better. But I know this, you can't leave out uh, the book of Jonah or uh, leave out Matthew and say, yeah, I believe it all but that. It's all together for one reason. Verse 40, so as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Having responded to the scribes and Pharisees with the direct declaration that no sign would be forthcoming except that, the prop, that of the prophet Jonah. Jesus, Jesus continued by elaborating on how Jonah constituted a sign. We recall that Jonah had attempted to run from God's assignment to preach in Nineveh. He took passage on a ship heading in the opposite direction. While running away from God, Jonah ran into a fierce storm, but the storm was not the worst part of Jonah's experience. The worst part was a three-day exile inside a great fish. God sent to rescue him from a watery death. Jonah came out of the ordeal with a changed mind. He was ready to hasten to Nineveh to do what God had called him to do. So Jesus points to the Old Testament in the story of Jonah. God had called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach. Well, what did he do? Very much like a lot of preachers that have I've heard tell their calling or, or, or preach and, and relate back to their calling, he turned and ran. He got on the first boat and was gone. However, when he got on that boat, there was a great storm. The guys on the boat realized that Jonah was causing a great storm. They threw him over. Then he swallowed by a large fish. Uh, in, in, in today's times, most of the time, we refer to it as a whale. And he spent three days and three nights in the belly of that whale. The whale basically up chucks him or throws him up and then when he's there when he when he comes out he's ready to go he's ready to go to Nineveh and preach God's God's word and Jesus said that is the sign that I'm going to give you I'm going to point you to Jesus compared Jonah's experience of spending three days in the fish to his upcoming days in the tomb which he described as being in the heart of the earth Two things stand out in comparison. First, in the observation that Jesus considered Jonah a, a historical person, not the main character in the work of fiction. Second was the fact that Jesus pointed to his resurrection from the dead, from the dead as, a, as the only sign he was willing to offer in response to the request from the scribes and Pharisees. So, again, he's going to point back to Jonah, taking the three days in the fish and the three days when he was in the tomb, until resurrection and all the sign that they need. Okay, you cannot believe in Jesus Christ without believing in a the virgin birth, b the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and that He is who He said He was, and that's all the sign you need. That's what our faith is based on: is that we believe what's in that Bible and that He is who He said He was. He was the only one. God come to the earth in human flesh, the sinless sacrifice for all of us. And that's what he's pointing to. That's the only sign we need. If we're looking for any other sign, 
You can look all over this world and spend all the money you want. But if you're looking for any sign, you're not going to find it. The sign is what it, it's in that book. It's Jesus. He came. He died. He was resurrected. He ascended to heaven. And he's sitting there at the right hand now. And if you don't have that faith, then you're, you're just like the scribes and Pharisees. You're always going to be looking. Show me something. Jonah experienced three days and three nights in the fish as applied to the burial of Jesus. These, the phrase three days and three nights was a common idiom by which to refer to the three days. In Jewish reckoning, any part of a day would be counted as one. Hence, Jesus was buried late on Friday, remained in the tomb all of Saturday, and was raised on Sunday, a sequence that would be described as being in the tomb three days. So what was the sign of Jonah? It was a parallel experience of Jonah's deliverance from the belly of the huge fish after three days and Jesus' deliverance from the belly of the earth on the third day. Jonah and Jesus were each sent by God and the ministry of each was certified as authentic by the deliverance from death. Jonah was the sign of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. While Jesus' many miracles should have been sufficient signs, the resurrection of Jesus is our ultimate sign that points to the truth that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah Sent from the Father, God has no greater evidence to offer. The bodily resurrection of Jesus stands as the Father's supreme authentication of his Son. The key doctrine, it says, God, Jesus was raised from the dead with a glorified body and appeared to his disciples as the person who was with him before his crucifixion. Now again, how much easier it would have been for all of us to have been there and been in these times. It would have been one of those 12 disciples who saw him raised from the dead. However, even one of the 12, Thomas, had to feel in his hands to, to believe. And, uh, you know, it would have been great. It would have been great to be able to see him do those miracles, walk on water, and prove to us. However, we don't get that luxury. It says a warning sign, verse 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment, with this generation and shall condemn it because they represent at the they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold a, a greater than Jonas is here as the pe as the chastened prophet Jonah took seriously God's assignment to preach in Nineveh the result was widespread repentance at his preaching okay so when Jonah went back to Nineveh there was widespread spread repentance of his preaching. Jesus drew a contrast between Nineveh's response to Jonah and the response of his generation to his ministry. Two points of contrast stand out. First, that of these were the fact that the pagan Gentiles, not the Jews, but the pagan Gentiles, who did not have the advantage of the laws of Moses and the preaching of the Old Testament prophets, had a better response to Jonah's proclamation than a generation, than a generation of Israelites did to the preaching of Jesus. After all, Jesus was their promised Messiah, the Jews should have recognized him as such and received him gladly. The example of the repenting Ninevites stood in stark contrast to the unrepenting generation in general and the closed-minded scribes and Pharisees in, in that particular. So again, he contrasts the Gentiles in Nineveh who repented at the preaching of Jonah versus the Israelites who had their Messiah, their promised Messiah, standing right there before them with no repentance. And we talked about that last week, the Gentiles versus the Israelites, and, and we'll get, get to the judgment in just a second. The second point of contrast was because, between the person of the human prophet and the person of the incarnate Son of God. The difference included the greater witness given by the divine Son over that, that given by a human prophet. To be sure... Jesus was a greater one than Jonah. And you think about it. No offense, I love hearing Daddy preach. I love hearing Brother Sheely preach. You know, there's several preachers in this county that I enjoy preaching. But how much would we pay for a ticket to hear Jesus Christ preach one time? Okay? I've spent a lot of money on tickets in my, my day. Matter of fact, I bet I can talk Sammy. Me and him would spend a lot of money to go see UT play any time he wanted to go. We can go pay a pretty penny. But how much money, how early would we get there and how much would we plan if we could have heard Jesus Christ teach? And then 
he's comparing his teaching and his preaching to Jonah. And he says, one greater than Jonah was there for the Israelites. Jesus summed up the result of these two contrasts with the declaration of the men of Nineveh would rise in judgment as condemnation of the unrepentant generation among, among whom Jesus preached. The underlying principles is that the greater opportunity brings greater responsibility. When greater opportunity is not seized, greater judgment falls. And I talked about that also last week. The more you hear the teaching and the more you hear the preaching and the more unrepentant you are, the more opportunity you had, the greater the judgment. Verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with his generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear wisdom of Solomon and behold, a uh, greater than Solomon is here. Jesus not only invoked the example of Jonah and the Ninevites, but also that of the queen of the south, identified in 1 Kings as the queen of Sheba. Like the Ninevites, the queen of the south was a Gentile. Nonetheless, her response to the wisdom of Solomon was remarkable. She traveled all the way from Arabia, described by Jesus as the uttermost parts of the earth, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Jesus was greater than King Solomon. His point was that the queen of Sheba would join with the Ninevites in leaving unbelieving Jews without exile. Jesus' intention was not to praise the Gentile examples, but to shame his unbelieving generation. And you think about that. He gives another example back to King Solomon and the Old Testament and the Queen of Sheba, tying it all together. But he says the Jews, you know, the Jews look down on the Gentiles. And again, he's saying that Jonah and the Ninevites, the Queen of Sheba, are all going to be there and going to be looking down in that judgment on the Jews who had this they had this great opportunity and it basically he kind of said a shaming unbelieving generation just as Jesus is greater than Jonah so is he greater than Solomon once again in contrast in that greatness put those who heard the preaching of Jesus the king of kings in danger of greater condemnation than the Gentile queen who responded in a praiseworthy manner to Solomon a human King. And again, he's there saying Jesus was greater than Jonah, Jesus was greater than Solomon, and they are sitting there in his presence and re failing to repent. In closing, it says, in my context, it says, Jesus calls for us to trust him in faith. Christian faith receives his death, burial, and resurrection as validating signs of the truth of his teaching as well as his identity as the Son of God, demanding that Jesus conform, conform to our terms leads to judgment. So in closing, I'm going to go back to the very first word that, uh, well, it's the second word. It says, what's the sign? The proof. If you want proof, all you have to do is open this book up and start reading. And then all it takes is the faith the size of the grain of a mustard seed, just a small ounce of faith. And my question is, which side are you on? Are you on the side that needs the proof and unbelief, or are you on the side of faith? Thank you guys for listening, and I hope you got something out of this. Have a good week.